folks, welcome to Board Game Breakfast. Woohoo! The biggest thing for me this week is Cosmic Con. Now, this is being held in Roseville, Minnesota at the Fantasy Flight uh, headquarters, basically, at their, their store that they have up there. This is being run by two of the original designers uh, for Cosmic Encounter, Peter Lotka and Bill Everly, and many other people involved in Cosmic Encounter, uh, Kevin Wilson, who brought around the Fantasy Flight reprint. Um, there's uh, Jay Little who did one of the expansions. I'm going to be there. It's just very exciting. I had nothing to do with it other than I like to play it a lot. Um, but lots of people there. They're going to be playing the game. And, uh, you know, it's a convention that's not that long. I'll be there Friday all day and Saturday morning. I can't be there longer than that. Sorry about that. But if you're in the area at all, come by, say hi. Hopefully I'll have some footage of both that and the Fantasy Flight Event Center so you can see what that's like. We'll have that for you guys next week. Okay, so that's coming up. Don't forget, if you like the Dice Tower and want to support us, you can go to Dicetower.com, click on Donate, and there's different promos that you can get to support the Dice Tower. And also, you can listen to the news, which comes now. Well, we've learned a little bit more about the next Dice Master sets that have come out. Uh, Uncanny Dice Masters will be coming out in quarter four of this year. And then in 2015, the next three sets of Dice Masters are DC Dice Masters Justice League, which is going to be exciting to play DC vs. Marvel, uh, Dungeons & Dragons Dice Master, and Age of Ultron has been announced. That's pretty cool. So that means there's a, you know, even if that's all the sets they've ever released, that's a ton of different dice. It'd be fun to play with those. NSKN has announced a new game called Versailles uh, by Andre Novak. He's the same guy who designed Exodus Proxima Centauri. In this game, you're a master builder trying to influence Louis XIV. Um, really? Okay, well, that's, that's so unique. Uh, but hey, he, he, Exodus Proxima Centauri is a really cool game, so you never know. Uh, Lookout slash Mayfair has announced a new game, J Jahari, uh, which is a game in which you're a gem dealer. Also, another theme that seems to be used a lot in the markets, buying and selling gems. But Lookout puts out some pretty impressive games, so this should be interesting. A new company has been founded, Renegade. Renegade is a spinoff. Scott Gaeta uh, from Cryptozoic has left Cryptozoic, and Cryptozoic announced this, so I guess it's all, you know, um, friendly. But he's gone off and he's starting his own company, Renegade, but they're taking many of the Cryptozoic titles with them, including Gravwell, uh, the Doom that came to Atlantic City, and Raffle, uh, the party game from John Kabalik. Gravwell and Raffle are some pretty cool games. So this will be interesting to see how this works. I think Cryptozoic looks to me like they're going to concentrate more on their uh, games that have a, a specific branding, whether uh, it's more, uh, well, they have the DC deck building games and the Lord of the Rings stuff. So who knows where this will line up, but, you know, we just talked a couple weeks ago about one company buying another. Here we have one company birthing another. So, hey, it all evens out. And then Games Workshop announced another reprinting of Space Hulk. <gasps> it's limited, I'm sure. Whatever, the last one was limited. If you'd like to pay a whole lot of money so that you can put together miniatures to play a game that's pretty much the same as games that cost less money and have just as cool miniatures, then buy Space Hulk. <laughs> I know I'm going to get hate in the comments. I've never even played Space Hulk, so I'm sure it's a good game. I've just never been willing to shell out that money for it. So. Now, if you notice, the shelves behind me look slightly different than they have in previous videos, uh, if you're the person who notices that sort of thing. And that's because over the weekend, I resorted out my games and just rearranged the shelves a little bit. And I also culled about 20 more games from my collection, putting in some of the newer games that I've gotten recently. I always get requests from people and saying, hey, what games are you keeping? What games are you getting rid of? Well, I don't really like keeping a tracking list of that for a lot of reasons, and I've talked about that before. But what I will do is I'll start showing you one shelf a week. And um, that will let you, and I'll tell you why I kept those games. They could be for various reasons. Maybe my kids like the game, my wife, or it fits in a certain situation, or I like it a lot. So here's to this week's shelf. First, we have a heavy Euro game, Lookout, uh, Lookout Games, La Havre. And I, even though I really also like Caverna a lot, La Havre just really has cemented this is a great two to three player game. And if I'm in the mood to play this sort of thing, and I, and I am, I, I really like this one. This one has seen a lot more play than many of the other games in my collection. Pals is a Carrera is actually a newer game in my collection. I've had it since last year uh, when they announced the Spiel des Jahres nominees. This was one of them. I picked it up uh, and I really have enjoyed it. It's light. 
it's a mid-weight Euro game. Now, there's a lot of games that meet that category, though, so I don't know how long this will be in my collection, but for now, it's one I like. Then I have two boxes here, Flashpoint and Extreme Danger, but both these have all the expansions that are currently out for Flashpoint. Flashpoint is a cooperative game about rescuing people from fire. I really enjoy it, and even if I didn't enjoy it, it's such a great game to teach new people. And then right next to it is Pandemic. This is the expansion box, Pandemic in the Lab, but I managed to fit everything in almost. They really need to make these boxes a little bit bigger. But this is everything from Pandemic in one box, and I also highly enjoy that. And they fit together kind of well. These are the two games that I often use to teach new people cooperative games. A great shelf. All right, Internet, this is a stick up. Give me all your money and nobody gets hurt. Nah, I'm just kidding. This year, 2014, at uh, Gen Con, Asmodee Editions and Repost Productions presented the second edition of Ludovic Moblanc's Cash and Guns. I'm here to tell you about the difference between the old game and the new game. One major difference, eight players can play the new version, only six for the old version. Now, in the original game, the loot is divided evenly by all the survivors of a round, and any money that can't be divided evenly just stays in the pot. In the new game, there is a drafting mechanism. There are always eight cards laid out, and all eight cards are going to get claimed. Now, there are also only two types of bullet cards in the new game. In the old game, you had clicks, you had bangs, and you had bang, bang, bangs. Bang, bang, bangs meant you were shooting faster than anybody else at the table, therefore you could shoot somebody before they had a chance to shoot you back. In the new game, it's just clicks and bangs. Another addition that the new game adds is the Godfather mechanic. The Godfather has two main privileges in the game. Number one, they get first choice of loot. Number two, they have the privilege to change someone's target. The final big change in the new edition is that the loot isn't just money anymore. In this game, there are bills, of course, but there's also diamonds and paintings. The more paintings you collect over the course of the game, the more valuable your overall collection is worth. And the person who has the most diamonds gets a $60,000 bonus in the form of the giant diamond. There's also loot that isn't money at all. First aid lets you get rid of all your wounds, so if you're on death's door, boom, suddenly you're back in the game, Goomba. The clips that you can take out of the loot pile, that means that you get to take a spent bullet card back out of the discard pile, and now maybe you've got another bang at your disposal. As long as you're not married to the old mechanics, I think you're going to find that the new version is really satisfying and still a lot of fun to play. Today I want to look at this website here, which is Tiny Wooden Pieces, and this is just a comic strip about board games. and. Now that seems like something that there might be a lot of. There actually isn't many of them. That's because it's hard to do. It's hard to have humor and have a knowledge about board games. This has the first time I've ever seen a wood for sheep joke that I actually laughed at uh, in this comic. And uh, let's see, the they, it's posted every week. There's one on each Friday. And so um, this last one, I think, was about dead of winter. And... Yeah, here it is, where a guy has all these medical supplies that are hidden inside his jacket, and so they exile him. Having just played Dead of Winter again this past Saturday, really enjoyable game, and this just fits it exactly. And I'm not going to spoil any more of these comics for you, and it's once a week, but they're funny, and, and, the, and the drawing works well, and it brings you into the theme of the game. I like these quite a bit, and I hope this, this comic lasts for a while. There's about, I think, 15 or 20 comics here right now, but check it out. Uh, subscribe to it. That's Tiny Wooden Pieces. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the Discriminating Gamer. Look, uh, I don't have much time. A few weeks ago, I reviewed Five Tribes from Days of Wonder, uh, and I, I thought it was going to be just a, a regular game, you know, a few laughs with friends. But uh, as I reviewed it, I, I learned something. The designer of this game... <laughs> is an elder god committed to destruction and evil. He goes by the name of Bruno Cthulhu.
Only the sick depths of a monstrous soul could come up with a game of, of worker manipulation on such a scale. Only the, the depths of purest darkness could produce a, a system where you have to bid for turn order and then move meeples around and place camels on a board. Now look, if you play five tribes, you'll probably have a lot of fun because it is a great game. You, you should check it out. Buy it! Good! Hey, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. And special guest. Sam Hill. All right, today for our question, we have a question from Willie, and he says, if someone like Z Garcia mentions that he likes some obscure game in a, one of his favorite game lists, or someone else just comes and says, this is one of my favorite games, and you've not played it, do you feel like you have to play it because someone else told you it was so awesome? Of course. If someone told you the game was terrible, would you feel like you had to play it? No, I would feel like I had to avoid it if someone told me it was terrible. But, like, at Gen Con recently, Z came up, he's like, you have to play Five Tribes, you have to play Five Tribes, it's awesome. And then I went to the table and I played Five Tribes, and I went around telling other people how awesome it was. And then everyone was going around telling everyone how awesome the game was. And I think it just spirals. Everybody everywhere. Alright, what about you? Uh, well, in the case of Z Garcia, I would probably actively avoid the game. Um, <laughs> but, uh, well, no, maybe not. He, he has brought some pretty good, pre pretty good uh, games to the table. But, I don't know. Um, it, I guess it depends on the person and, and what I know about them and how much uh, overlay their likes are with my likes. If I know that we like the same kind of games and they say, you need to try this game out, then yeah, I want to go out and try it. But... If I know that they are an avid Euro gamer, <laughs> Ryan Mitzler, um, I, I usually say, yeah, I think I'll probably stay away from that game. So it, it really depends on who, who who's who's saying you need to try the game. Did, wait, didn't I get you to play Yunnan? And that's a total Euro game. How did I get you to play that one? Because you uh, lied. Well, <laughs> no, I said it was not, a Euro. It's not so much that. When, when I'm in a group, I'll play what the group wants to play. But if somebody comes up to me and says, you need to try this game out, if it's a person that I know is an avid Euro gamer, I'll probably say no, thank you, or I'm not gonna break my arm trying to get it played. There are some folks in our group who, if they tell in our gaming group that they say this game's really good, I, I don't want, I have my, I lose all interest in it. <laughs> and other people will say, oh, this game's really fun, and I'll be like, oh, I kind of like the same games. It all depends on the person, really. Right. So that's it. If you guys have questions for us, you can always email us at dicetower at gmail .com. See you next time. Hey folks, if you remember last week, I told you that most of the reviews I was doing that week were going to be very positive. And if you watch those reviews, they were. I really like those games. Not so much this week. There are a few games, let's see, of the 10 games. I'm trying to review 10 games a week, and I've done that since uh, Gen Con. And of the 10 games that I have here in front of me, which I'm not showing you because I don't want to spoil it, let's see, negative, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, 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 negative. Well, oh man, oh well. That's okay though, because the positive ones are really good, and the negative ones aren't they're not that atrocious, then you might like them anyway. So check that out. Lots of reviews coming from me. And the top 10 100 lists are over from Z and Sam. But this week, we have the top uh, 10 lists coming from me, Z and Sam. Our top 10 war games. I'm sure that will create somewhat of a buzz. Um, and then next week, keep an eye, next week, uh, both my top 100 of all time and Dan King's top 100 of all time will be coming at you. And then, of course, other reviews. I think Ryan Metzler will be reviewing Panamax this week. We got some other reviews coming your way, so don't worry. Plenty of content on this channel. And, of course, if that's not enough for you, Dicetowernetwork.com has plenty of podcasts and places you can listen to about your favorite things. Oh, and... Check out Dice Tower, the audio podcast. This coming Tuesday, Eric and I completely spoil Risk Legacy. Talk about everything we've seen in the game. So uh, you can listen to most of the podcasts. It's at the end where we talk about Risk Legacy, and we'll tell you, turn it off now if you don't wish to be spoiled. But we've been dying to talk about it now, so that was our chance. Anyhow, lots of cool stuff coming out this week. Let's move on.
Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise here with the next installment in my Meeples for Sheepish Peoples series, discussing the social activity of board games in the lives of people who aren't necessarily socially outgoing. Now, up to this point, I've focused on preventing the butterflies in your stomach caused by attending gaming events as a participant. But this time, let's discuss another way to potentially prevent gastrointestinal lepidoptera by changing your role at a gaming event, switching from the hosted to the host. Cue unnecessary theme music! Unnecessary theme music! Now, this may be a good time to again mention that this suggestion is simply based on my own experience, and your mileage may vary. But, at least for me, I found that I'm more comfortable in a group if it's a group that I've organized, even if it's a portion of a larger event. Okay, for, for example, a couple hundred people attend my town's largest gaming event. I attended, nervous and shy in the crowd as I looked for a game to join. But I also scheduled and hosted a Wits and Wagers game show event there. Now, while I was hosting the game, oh, I was fine, engaging with people, making jokes, generally being pretty awesome. Even though I was still interacting with strangers, the difference was that I was doing it within a setting that I had organized and I was in control of. So it's possible that your role within a social situation can affect your comfort level within it. It's possible that putting yourself in charge of an event may help melt away some of the anxiety, allowing for more games with more people more comfortably. Now, it may be worth trying, but again, everyone's different. Your mileage may vary. Your mileage may vary. Today we're taking a look at what else? Dice towers. Now these dice towers are from Fox Tower and they were printed with a 3D printer and they're made of the same material that Lego bricks are made out of. Now there's, four, there's three sizes and there's two colors. There's black and gray. And my good friend Sam Healy has taken a look at these already and he says he thinks he can dry brush these and make these look really cool. And the price of these is really not that bad. You can get two of these small ones for $20, making them $10 each. And you'll notice this piece comes right off like that. In fact, they are basically made up of, the small ones are made up of two pieces that are put together. The medium one here is made up of three pieces that snap together. Very easy to snap them together. And then this large one here is also made up of three, besides not counting the ring here. And you don't even have to have that ring on there. Just realize that the dice will come shooting out all over the table. Now, the, the dice, let's, I'm going to show you an example of how they roll. So here's some regular dice. We'll throw them in the big one. It's a little noisy. I like the noise myself, but that, keep that in mind. They also go down in the medium one, and then the small one, they also work in that one. Now, King of Tokyo size dice will not work in the small one. Um, however, I found that this one is a great die for when you have a bunch of little dice or a few small dice, like if I'm going to be playing Summoner Wars, which I'm rolling a lot of dice in, or maybe Hero Escape. It's great because each person can have their own little dice tower. And Sam tested out Kingsburg dice in them, and that works. And so he's thinking about really uh, making his Kingsburg set nice, buying some of these gray towers and then uh, shading them different colors so each player has their own little colored dice tower. Anyhow, I was really impressed with these. When I first got them, I wasn't sure, but man, if I can dry brush these or paint these and make them even look nicer, but even straight out of the box like this, it's a good three-dimensional dice tower worthy of the name Dice Tower. And so that's um, uh, Fox Tower. I found them on Amazon, on Etsy. There's different places you can find these and purchase them. Hi, Suzanne here with this week's Featured Board Game App. I cover a lot of play deck games in this segment, but one we haven't discussed yet is Food Fight. This deck building game seems underappreciated to me in general, so let's take a quick look and see if it's something you might want to check out. In Food Fight, you build the best dish or food army that you can bring into the battlefields of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Each meal round you get a drafting phase, after which you select the food fighters that go into your deck. These reveal one at a time and go head to head with your opponent's fighter. Highest card wins a mint, most mints wins a round, and you play meal rounds until someone gets 10 points. 
The randomness of the draft, combined with the deck building and the random reveal, is likely the biggest turnoff to gamers. But there is strategy in drafting and serving the most reliable card combos. I also really like the instant cards you can play from your hand that impact the battle. It adds a nice extra layer of planning. Because it's play deck, the production quality is very high and the art looks great on the screen. That said, like other text-heavy card games, you'll be doing a lot of capping to zoom into the card to read, even on a tablet screen. There is, of course, also a great tutorial and multiple AIs. One odd thing is that the online play is managed through Game Center instead of Playdeck's normal proprietary system like that you use in Lords of Waterdeep. The highlight of Food Fight, without a doubt, is the campaign mode. In this single-player option, you are pitted against a series of mascots and their underlings. You must win against the underlings to get to the mascot, and when you beat that, you unlock new cards in the campaign mode collection to play later. Personally, I think the art is really cool, and I like the thematic and punny humor used throughout the game, but if that doesn't appeal to you, then I'm not sure the gameplay will override that. All that said, Food Fight is a solid draft and deck builder that is really fun to play on the tablet. Give it a try. From Open Box Games Jr. and welcome to Component Moment. And today we're going to take a look at Hurry Cup, a game about racing cars. So let's take it for a test drive. Actually, let's go home because it's easier to show you the components on the table. Now we're back, so let's open the box. Harry Cup comes with lots of tokens that have items and abilities on them. There are different colored die for each of the characters. And a big, huge one die, and a shaker to shake them in. Would you look at the size of these pawns? They're huge! And it also comes with different colored cars, and motorcycles. There's a massive star tail. It looks like Monaco. And the best part, it comes with modular tiles so the board is different every time you play. So I mean from Open Box Games Jr. So see you next time. Bye. folks today I just want to talk about something that is not that important at all but something that is entertaining and interesting to think about and that is setup versus takedown time. Now if you play in my play group most people are often very happy because when we're done with the game let's say we've just finished playing Abyss all right this is a game with this fearsome looking guy in the cover. Now if you open up my copy of Abyss right now and you looked at the piece inside you might be horrified um, but you wouldn't be because they're actually all nice and straight. But for most of my games, that when I when we're done playing them after the first time or two, I'll tell everybody, just throw it in the box. They throw it in the box, I go home, and that's when I do my component drops, and then I start everything out neatly when I'm done with that. That's me. That's a rare thing. But you know what? I've seen people do that before. When a game is over, they sweep everything in the box, and they go home, and they want to be the person who carefully puts everything away. Now, I personally think that if the person isn't like that, if there's someone who starts sorting it out there, that if you play a game, it's your responsibility to help put that game away. Come on, guys. I, mean, I play games before everyone starts, help, and one guy gets up and wanders off. Like, where are you going? Oh, I'm going to go try out this game. Maybe you want to help clean up this one? Especially if it has a lot of pieces. Setup time can also be a lot for games, too. And I know some people will take a lot of effort and they'll put all the pieces in the bag um, that you need to start to set up the game with. So your bag will have your starting money, it will have all your color pieces in it, it will have your starting cards. For a game where you have a lot of things you start with, it's all in there ready to go, everything's sorted out, ready to go. And so my curiosity is, and I'd love to see this in the, in the comments here below the YouTube video, which would you prefer? Which do you prefer? Do you prefer to take a whole lot of extra time at the end of a game, bag everything up very neatly, and get those starting bags set so that when you're ready to play a game, you open it up and just pull everything out and you're ready to go? Or do you put the game away neatly, but at the, you don't really care if you have the starting setup. You're willing to take more time to set up at the beginning of the game because when you start the beginning of the game, that's when people have time to you know, talk and you're explaining some of the game as you set up and it's, you know, people are kind of settling in to play the game. 
Obviously, I just gave you all my reasons. That's what I do. I don't necessarily have to have a bag with everything ready to go. I have some of my games like that, but for the most part, I'd rather put the game away quickly and take longer setting it up. But I know people, like Sam Healy, for example, are the complete opposite of me. And I'm just curious what you would think. Now, so, I don't know. Setting up a game can be a pain in the neck, and taking it down can be a pain in the neck, but it's stuff that needs to be done. And I think it should be done neatly. You should take care of your components. You should put them in, you know, I throw all mine in a box uh, when I'm about to do a component dump. But after that, I'm trying to be very careful. I usually have different bags for each grouping. If the person who's putting the game away is very specific with how the game is put away, I listen to them too. You know, what goes in this bag? Where does this go? <laughs> Check with them first. Anyhow, I guess that's not a very thoughtful Tom thinks, but I'm just curious what you guys do. Take more time setting the game up or take more time tearing it down. Hey, it's the Captain here. Welcome back to Carry On, my four-part mini-series discussing gaming on the go. Today, on the final episode, we're going to be looking at some simple solutions for sandy situations. Now, you might be out in the desert, perhaps on a federally funded field trip to a foreign fighting area, like me, or maybe you're just going to the beach. Either way, the wind and the sand can really do a number on your components and your card games. If you're headed to a sandy destination, leave the card games home. Instead, bring a dice game. My first recommendation is from Steve Jackson Games, the very popular Zombie Dice. In this push-your-luck dice rolling game, you play the part of a zombie trying to eat delicious brains, but watch out for too many shots by the shotguns. If you really like pushing your luck with dice, and maybe zombies and brains just aren't your thing, try Martian Dice instead by Tasty Minstrel Games. My next recommendation is very similar. In fact, it's the godfather of dice rolling push your luck games, Farkle. In Farkle, all you need is six dice. Farkle may not be quite as thematic as zombie dice or the chupacabra, but this simple game with just six dice is easy to add to anybody's collection. For my next recommendation, go to your closet and grab that used yard sale copy of Yahtzee that you have yet to play in years. Grab all the components, dump them in a random bag, yank the drawstring, and you are set. And my last recommendation, Bananagrams by Bananagrams. In this scrabble light game, I recommend three to five players. You get to make your own crosswords, but there's a couple of different variants of the rules. It's a ton of fun, easy to take with you, give it a try. And that's it for now. I hope you've got some great ideas for gaming on the go. Get out there, have some fun. Until next time, carry on. Well, that's it, folks. I got some reviews to get cracking before I get fly out to St. Paul this week um, and see some of you guys at the Fantasy Flight Folk. Um, while I'm there, I'll play Cosmic Encounter. Maybe I'll get a chance to play Imperial Assault. That'd be cool, too. Um, but anyhow... Uh, that will be fun and exciting, and man, there's just so many great things coming up. There are games that I'm still looking at that I, there's games that I'm, be, there's a few games I'll be talking about this week that are pretty cool, and some that aren't so cool, but there's also games in the future. Man, I played, wow, I played a game this weekend that was just super hard, killed us, and I still like the game, but I'll talk about that in an upcoming week. Anyway, until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at coolstuffinc.com.